globalization, uh, the mass media technologies, the communication technologies in the classroom, and then now study abroad. And all that, I think, is reshaping higher education. Uh, the study abroad uh, phenomenon is amazing. Already, for a long time, 
the students have been able to directly and in person confront uh, diverse cultures and uh, to confront the interdependence of economic systems. And, uh, Sasha and I uh, are passionately, uh, heart and mind, devoted to the flourishing of uh, international education because there's been that axial shift from American education, in, our, in the case of our schools, to international education. And I don't think it can be stopped. I, th I, I don't think we can retrench back into the old academy. I think that it, it is international. And so we're passionately committed to this flourishing of international education. And that flourishing, of course, is facing some major challenges uh, rooted principally in uh, human resource management and capital development. I'm especially keen on capital development because I'm broke. <laughs> <laughs> we have some very rich people who like Gonzaga and Florence and who were students in the program. And uh, I would love to have some of their money be devoted to <laughs> our students. I'll be commenting on that a little later. Uh, but human resource management is really important, and, we'll, and if you look at our carefully at the, at the program, uh, we have uh, folks that will be confronting how do we treat a number of questions, especially in the place of faculty uh, in study abroad programs in, in, in Italy, also uh, the resident directors, what kind of competencies should they have internationally, and what kind of competencies should the persons back home have. Do they, should they have international competence? So I think that the themes of this conference are really very important. And I'm really pleased that this is the first. <laughs> we just talking about it. <laughs> Hopefully there will this be a second This is the first. Time. So uh, Sasha and I are uh, directors of two of the oldest programs uh, in the city. Her program began in 59 and ours in 63. I was a student uh, in 1964 uh, at Gonzaga in Florence, so it's been wonderful being able to come back as dean and director. But I want to let you know, and I want to share with the words of Sasha that, that we welcome you, and we're really pleased that you, with your interest in what we're going to be doing. Thank you. Thank you. This is all meant to just, especially in my case, just to have an overview of the challenges in our field and of um, points that need attention, discussion, and academic and scholarly research. There's a lot of lack of literature in our field, and I think it's very important that we start collecting data and we start um, doing research in our field and we start talking about ourselves, as I said, in a different way, in a different language. Because this is, a, as a, you know, the, top, the main topic today is on human resources and capital development. Let me just first say how thankful, I have no words for me really to thank the staff here in Syracuse. When I started my job here two years ago, I was impressed. I'm, I'm, I've been in this, field, in this business for 15 years now as working for other universities and providers, but I was impressed with the high level, really high quality of um, staff and faculty here, really. And I, now I, at the very beginning, I, I kind of could say that more because I was just starting, but now after two years, it looks like I'm not bragging too much about our work, but I really wanted to be yeah, <laughs> kind of you know, promoting. But I was really impressed, and I wanted to thank everyone who's helped, you know, from the gardener, to do what Osama is like to fix you know, chairs. I wanted to really thank everyone for helping um, me us organize this. It's uh, yesterday I was walking around and I was just looking at everyone running around and I was and I, I had this I was really moved because of wow, everyone is taking care of their little thing uh, with you know without I Without even me saying anything, at one point I we broke um, we we had the, this break for the doing the workshop. I didn't even know where it was organized. That's how how much I had delegated things. So 
So really <laughs> thank you everyone here. There's Sylvia, Amy, Camille, um, Michelle, Francis, who are part of our staff, our coordinators, and men on the tail, going up. But thank you very much, really. It's a Peter, sorry. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So let's start. Um, oops, I may do this. What I'll do, what I plan to do in this um, time here, I, I want to do a oh, gym, sorry. <laughs> missing. So what I, what I plan to do today is just to give a very gener generic and generalized overview of um, some um, areas that need to be addressed in this specific field and some topics that need attention. First of all, um, when we talk about human resources, we obviously talk about a uh, home country, whether it's US or Australia, I used to work at Australian University before, uh, and a host country. So it could be Italy, it could be France, it could be Spain. So it's obvious that one of the main challenges that we face in our field is the clashes of legal system, labor, labor standards, um, um, work ethics, work priorities. I mean, there, there are major differences. So one of the challenges we face every day, bodies here, <laughs> you know, legal matters, we, yeah, we, we I'm need. not the problem. No, 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 but, no, you're not the problem, but you are the physical evidence of how important this is, you know, we all know. Um, so for those who don't know, John Franco Borio is the lawyer of the Alpine uh, Association, okay. So um, secondly, uh, I would like to talk about the challenges of senior management at home campuses. We tend to discuss our challenges here locally as directors, what are our difficulties and you know what we face every day, but I also wanted to bring up what the challenges of senior management are. What is it that they, you know, what, what problems they face every day, what, kind of how, what is it that we as director present to them and how they try to assess those problems. Third, um, roles, positions, uh, definitions of our roles, titles, what we do, how we do it, how this is defined, the workloads, responsibilities, our professional identity, what are we? Are we part of the home practice? Are we not? It's a major dilemma. What kind of training and formal educational path is available in our field? And also, if we, I would like to address the fact that if we talk about, we may disagree on whether education is a commodity, but regardless, if we talk about international education as a business, I want to discuss about the impact of inadequate human resources management in international education when we treat it as a business. And conclusions. I really hope we'll have, we will have a little debate at the end of this, so I'm planning to have a little bit of time to not for Q and A's, but for debate. <laughs> okay. So let's start with the first point: clashes of systems and standards. As I said, we always—it's obvious. We have—we are working in with different legal system. We're working with different labor system. We are working with different unionized <coughs> cultures. We have—we work with different ethics and performance expectations, what may be perceived a good performance, professional performance here in Italy may not be perceived equally in the United States or in Australia. We, uh, we uh, manage human resources differently. We manage human resources differently. We recruit differently. We train differently. We think about training differently. And the salary range is supposed to be different. So, the, you know, we're trying to put all this together. I will just um, talk about a little, a little anecdote that I heard uh, a few um, a few moments ago. It was during your coffee break. Um, these, our study group program is uh, hiring a person. And thankfully, someone in life in our office study in Syracuse has asked one of our staff members, Amy, to be part of the search committee. And how many are you in the search five people in the search committee to look for this person? 
Of all five people, Amy was telling me 10 minutes ago that the priority of four of these people was the academic background and the professional experience in the, in the, in the uh, field that the person is uh, searched for. Okay? Only Amy, and because she's located here, for her the priority was experience, or at least the intention to be working with international students and in international education. This is how different the priorities in hiring and training are. Four people out of a you know, search committee not aware of what we need locally when we talk about this. Was, this is a case manager, so we're talking about student emergencies. And you all know, especially directors here, know how, this, how important this is. We deal with student emergencies all the time. And none of these people were thinking, we need a person who's had international experience or wants to have international experience. And, and again, this, there's no good or bad here. There's not, you know, it's just, it's, it's different. And how do we put this together? Um, and again, very different way in approach. I know I'm an HR person, I'd like to hear your point of view. There are different ways of approaching uh, HR management. I'll let you read the quote, but I think it's interesting for me. of our role, alienation, and how many problems we have, labor issues, unions, and you know, media, and blah, blah, blah. Um, but what are the challenges of senior management at home campuses? <coughs> First of all, are we part of the home campus or not? Is there a clear definition? Is that someone that says, yes, you are? How we define salary ranges, titles, there's a major dilemma, you know, with good faculty <coughs> to that point. <coughs> Do we have access to the same benefits and training opportunities? Is that possible? Maybe it's not possible. But let's let's think about it. Maybe maybe we don't want to go there. Maybe that is not, but, but let's not avoid this question. I think it's important that we ask that question. And we may find surprising answers, but it's important to start asking this question. Secondly, do the um, practices for managing human resources at home campuses, can they be applied to study? Can they? Maybe it's, again, maybe it's not possible. Um, there are, in student services, there are things that are done at home campuses that cannot be done in study of program. Maybe they don't even, there's no sense for doing them here. Again, we want to ask ourselves this question. We want to help, we want to assist senior management <coughs> to try and address these questions. Um, and then can those practices be transferred? And if, if, if they can, how? How can that be done? Third, how is it possible to inform senior management adequately? Think about Emo, think about the Fermenter Reform, think about Profumo, that was another, you know, the <coughs> to, to which extent do you say things? To which extent, now the government, do we have a government, we don't have a government, and the Emo this morning was uh, postponed to September, do you 
say those things. Yes, we will have the EVAs going up to 23%. You plan that in the budget. You don't plan in the budget. How do you process that information to try and not create too much anxiety? I'll get to this point. I, I always make this joke. I don't manage people or a region. All I do is managing anxiety all the time. Mm -hmm. This is my job. I manage anxiety. The anxiety about the professional role, anxiety about our numbers, about the printer not working, about the, <laughs> for the weather, whatever. Or the parent being anxious about the premises here. So how do we try to help senior management at the home campus to get the appropriate and necessary information in a way that is constructive and helpful? What do we say? How do we say? How can how can we improve this process of communication? And again, I'm not going to go into details. And then, how can we uh, address cultural differences? For instance, there is a tendency in anglophone cultures because of the historical differences in the labor. Um, History, there is a tendency to um, use dismissal as a solution to HR problem, which also is not a, in Italy when we talk about dismissal, oh, you know, it's a big deal. It's not if the job market is fluid as it is in the US, in Australia, in the UK. Okay, you can move on, that's easy. But it's not in Italy countries such as Italy, Spain, France in a different way, you know. Is this a solution? Is this a a good practice is, you know, how can we can we address this? This can open up, it's a it could be a good box. And again, how can we help senior management with this? How can we solve when, when there are problems? How, how can we address this? What what can we do? What, what could be a good practice? I'm very glad actually we had the workshop on the standards yesterday. Um, okay. Now let's talk about roles, position descriptions, and, and um, you know, responsibilities. What is, what is the first and most important key role in a study, any study program, whether it has 10 students or 200? What is it, one person that is needed? Student. Faculty, students, key role, to run, to run, a study of program to run a study of what is the key role? IT. IT. <laughs> <laughs> a whole team, you cannot say one person. No, but let's say you don't have the budget. You want to be in a university, you want to right. open a program with five right. students. Right. The director, okay? In my opinion, you need a legal representative. You need someone who signs checks. Someone that opens a bank account, takes the legal responsibility, someone that brings the students to a hospital when there's an emergency, and someone that leases the premises, that signs a contract. Okay? That's the one per whether you have a hundred a hundred students or ten students. That's the first person that you need, okay? Regardless of numbers. Then we have other, uh, and we have other areas that need to be managed in any study abroad program, any offshore activities, whether it's a branch or it's a, it's a you know, provider or whatever. <coughs> and again, regardless of the number of students, we, we need to have a budget, we need to have facilities, we need to, have, we need to take care of students' housing, again, whether it's five students or 500, we need to create curriculum development, academic teaching courses. That's what we are about. Um, risk management and security, students and student life, legal matters and visas, not just for students, but also for, for faculty, field trips, emergencies. You may have more staff or not, but if you do more than one person, you will have to handle contracts, nature and unions. Assessment and monitoring of the program is necessary, it's fundamental. Strategic planning, marketing, PR, networking, visitors, leaders, school, partner universities, parents, they're getting more and more involved. 
<laughs> I'm spending more and more time with the parents. It's becoming an area that needs to be managed. So again, regardless of the number of students that the program has, this all has to be covered. All of this. All of this. There are directors here. Do you disagree? Do you agree? I mean, So, you may have one person in the staff, two people in the staff, and then you, you know, regardless of the quantity of students and staff that you have, you will have to cover all those areas. You were telling me yesterday, you manage your staff in a flexible way because you need to cover all, that, all those areas. And when you have a turnover problem, you have a whatever, that needs to be covered. You, can, you cannot tell a student who's in the hospital, oh, I'm sorry, I don't have anyone covering for housing, or I don't have anyone covering for emergency, okay? I wanna, I've been reading some position description for resident directors just for fun. I want to quote one. Of course, I'm not going to say who, who was searching for this position. This was published in 2012, I believe. Getting old. Um, this is a resident director in uh, the Middle East. This is a position description for the, for the resident director. It's uh, five pages. <laughs> It was online. I'm not going to say again who's, you know, who, who, whether it's a provider or whatever. So the resident director, according to the position's description, is responsible for long range planning, uh, ongoing program evaluation, um, development, marketing, customer satisfaction, advise students, monitor changes in enrollment, monitor the quality of instruction, prepare student grade reports, serve as the first point of contact for any student request teach one or more course, maintain the program library, hold regular and local site office hours, obtain current and reliable information concerning health and safety, write an annual safety audit covering. I'm just reading a few lines, okay? I'm not reading everything. <laughs> <laughs> Secure appropriate medical and professional services, develop and maintain emergency preparedness, manage student evaluation, write the rest and director report at the conclusion of each academic year, Participate in the formulation of the program budget, establish and maintain local banking arrangement and procedures for transfer of funds to the program, manage program finances, submit monthly expenses report, um, hire, supervise, and pay any necessary staff or subcontractors, participate in the writing of program materials, represent the program on sending school campuses affairs, other duties as assigned. <laughs> okay? Then, each, it, the position description reads, each resident director is responsible for one study center. This typically represents one to three employees and 10 to 400 students. <laughs> okay, this gives a ratio of uh, one employee can cover from 10 to 130 students. Okay? Um, then the position description continues, respond quickly to student, parents, and or sending school needs. Then, this is interesting too, and the A or its required PhD preferred candidate must have an academic background and has to know the local language and has to be uh, native or near native fluent in the known language. Um, which is interesting because the position description is requested that an academic background but has to manage finances and budget and communication, okay? Then, uh, finally, and again, I've not read the whole position description, the rest of the rep is expected to be on call for emergency circumstances 24 hours a day, seven days a week. <laughs> okay. And this, again, this is a real example, okay? Um, I wanted to read this just this is probably an excess, but I wanted to bring this up to, to really discuss about how um, difficult it is for 
senior management to open a program, try to cover all those areas, no funds, it's the same, no money, how we do it, what we do it, what standards are available, what is the culture in the field. If we want to, I think it's necessary, if we want to think about ourselves as high level quality professional as we are, we have to start having standards and we have to start using a different language. I think it's important that we focus on this one and we start discussing this one. So, um, now, a very delicate point here. I'm touching a hot topic that's particularly hot here in Florence. Has received some media coverage, but it's it's. Um, I went at the forum conference there were um, people from France discussing this too, and and I can tell it's really a trendy topic right now, <coughs> and a lot of people start feeling very um, strong about this. Again, going back to the initial, you know, the beginning of my presentation, what are we? Are we part? of the home campus or not. And especially, let's talk about faculty. <coughs> the word used to define faculty inside of our program often, not always, is adjunct. What does the word adjunct mean? Anyone? The temporary arrangement. I'm not adjunct, just, just the word. No, let's not talk about the title. The word adjunct. What was again adjunct? Additional. Not relevant, right? <laughs> okay? It's not important. It's something in addition to. Okay? Adjunct. In addition to something else which is core, which is relevant and important. An adjunct is in addition, okay? <laughs> now, the U.S. is sending 270,000 students abroad every year. And this number is growing, growing tremendously. If there's one business that is not suffering the economic crunch, it's international education. It's going <coughs> up and up and up. And if we think about study abroad, can we still think, I mean, Faculty who teach inside of our programs are the <laughs> core element of the academic life in a study of our program. Can we still define faculty in study of our program as additional, not relevant, collateral, adjunct? Is that possible? What is the again, what is the language that we're using for with, to define ourselves? Is this representative of our professional field? We are fighting what is called the bikini, um, the bikini, what is that? The bikini factor. And we, how can we continue to fight the bikini factor if we think and refer to ourselves as agile? How can we continue promoting the prestige and academic standards of our field if we don't use a professional language? This is where we have to start being aware of what we are, what we do, and what our mission is. I think it's important that we start reflecting on this, and that's why I wanted this conference. Well, what is the bikini factor? Sounds interesting. The bikini <laughs> factor? <laughs> Someone calls it the <laughs> Sounds interesting, right? <laughs> uh, Someone calls it, uh, what is it the other one? Disneyland. It's this whole idea, or I yeah, call it. I'm less interested already. I call it. Okay. <laughs> I call it, uh, I call it, I personally call it poster hacking, postcard traveling. The whole idea that if you go to study abroad, um, you don't learn. Gotcha. Or the whole idea that studying abroad is just about fun. It could be, it could be, but it may even not be just that. So I that's the meaning. I don't want to teach you bikini though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a lot, there's a lot to, there's a lot to talk about. When we promote our programs, you know, smiling faces, beaches, uh, you know, how do we promote ourselves? And of course, if we go to, uh, I've been, you know, Zurich is promoting our program, and you know, he can't say, come to our program, you're going to study a lot. It's very challenging, and you're going to spend all the time in your room, you know, you know, and you're going to be graded very harshly, and it's 
what we do, how we do it, facilities, who, who's you know, behind the scenes. And so that, how can you develop the identity of the program if all these factors are so fluid and flexible? Um, I, um, last night, yesterday we attended this workshop on the standards and um, Rand Whale, who's the president of the Forum of uh, Education Abroad, uh, shared with us the preliminary report on, uh, on a, a study that they're, they're doing in um, you know, staff and faculty in study abroad education. So I read this last night at midnight, and I added two more slides to my presentation this morning. This is one of them, and I wanted to share with you uh, again, talking about titles, job functions, responsibility, interpretation of our roles. I don't, I'll, I'll leave this on the desk. I do literally didn't have the time to scan this and put it inside this morning. But uh, this is a little relation between title and function. Okay. <coughs> What they did, they uh, they requested to all those responding to this questionnaire to provide their title and then define, give a, a percentage of how much time they devote. They, you know, these people were devoting to each specific area, and and the the total had to be a hundred. So, if you look at the graphs and tables, what you see at the end is that most people do most of everything. So this is how titles and responsibilities and roles are not clear. Okay, there's no not clear standards, and there's there's a lack of standardized responsibilities. This is just a start, just the beginning. But this is why I'm saying we need data. We need to talk about this. We need to start doing research. We need to discuss this in a more concrete way. And 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 this is just staff and faculty in international education, okay, whether here or in the US, only international education professionals, okay. I will have another slide on this later on. Um, now, one other thing that I think is never highlighted enough is the specific expertise in our area, in our field. <coughs> The, big, the biggest debate for faculty is whether faculty should be doing research or not, you know? That's the biggest debate. There's, you know, the whole can we track the number and are we part of the not, the title, all of that. I'm not going to go into that because it's a hot topic and I would like to have a debate on that. But I want to point out <coughs> specific activities that we do have in our field and are not taken into consideration both for faculty and staff. First of all, we all, regardless of whether we've been trained on it or whether we are aware of, of it or not, we all have in, in, in intercultural and cross cultural expertise. We develop it because we're in the field. Um, majority of us are bilingual. We don't have to be, but we end up being. And we act whether staff or faculty as cultural interpreters. I think about language instructor, for instance. If I ask any language instructor, do you teach cross-cultural competence? You'd say no. You'd say no. I, you'd say I'm not, I'm not prepared, I'm not qualified, I don't have a, a title. But in fact, in fact, that happens. That happens naturally. You teach language, you teach language, you teach pronunciation, you teach you teach grammar, but you teach uh, intercultural competence, and you teach cross-cultural analysis as well, directly. This is not highlighted enough, and that happens in class as well. That you know, job that you do with the with the university funds, that happens naturally. Is that said in any syllabus in you know, art history, for instance, when you go to a museum, you will explain much more and beyond what is the, uh, you know, how each syllabus has the 
uh, objectives, you know? But if you do it here with faculty being trained here, faculty being trained internationally, it will necessarily have a different pedagogical and didactic approach. And I don't think this is recognized sufficiently. Then, um, the teaching experience, the didactic and pedagogy in study of program is, has a lot to do with field trips and field studies. It's a natural thing that you know, has, that happens and has to happen. And, and there's a lot of professional preparation behind that. The Fornetto reform forced us to do all those training and safety and security. But a lot of those were found naturally taking care in different ways and sometimes informally, sometimes kind of uh, casually about, you know, preparing people to handle emergencies and difficulties while outside of the class. Because this is also an important part of our professionality. We do have to be aware of these problems and then, you know, teaching outside of a classroom space is different and has different challenges in a different culture, of course. And I also think that faculty in study the program have a very strong pedagogic and didactic flexibility because not only we teach to uh, a, you know, very uh, an immense variety of students coming from all sorts of uh, universities, but we also, the more and more we have international students, uh, you know, we have students with different uh, cultural backgrounds, uh, Asian students are being more and more common these days as international students and freshmen. We know how much um, that, you know, that is very problematic in terms of the use of the language. And, and as a faculty, you have to take into consideration that, you know, with papers and grading them, and how do you handle that? And, you know, a oral presentation can be difficult and painful sometimes. And studying abroad has, you know, necessarily Professionals in our field develop a different sensitivity to this and a different professionality that I think is not adequately recognized. Um, so, my question today, which I would like to convey, is can we sell international education if we're not internationalized? <laughs> to which extent? Are we, are we really producing what we say we are? Especially when we talk about senior management. And I'm going back here to this uh, report. 59% of professionals working in international education has never been abroad. Never. Okay? 59%. What do you mean by that? Not travel? Leave. Leave, yeah. I would say. That's a good question. I often ask myself, is what do you define, you know, uh, study abroad? I would say that a minimum of a three months and a half is the minimum that you would expect from, you know, hence a semester abroad. It's the minimum that you should expect in our field to have that kind of thing. So going back to the case manager, I think that should be the minimum requirement. Minimum, not only to make sure that the person has a professional understanding of our field, but these have to start to be the standards of training and selecting our field. We have to start being uh, self, you know, self-aware of what our strengths are and what is it that defines our role. The other number. Does that figure uh, refer to senior management or management? No, no, no. That's in general of all respondents. However, there's another, and again, I'll leave this here, I couldn't make copies. Um, there's another interesting section that talks about, you know, all title, job titles in international education management. There's a president, vice president, provost, dean, director, program <coughs> manager, resident director, marketing coordinator, business uh, manager, coordinator, advisor, and administrative assistant. Eight of the 14 job titles listed here responded that had not a lead abroad. When we talk of a province, seventy percent of provosts who have responded have never been abroad. Again, can we sell international sell? And allow me to use this very negative word 
Can we sell international education if we are not internationalized? Can we, how can we manage this field? Questions? I think that the other problem with the side of that one is also the communication between the home campus and the study abroad campus is limited if the people at, at the home campus don't have the international uh, you know, expertise. expertise. Yeah, in fact, they don't know what's really going on. They don't, sometimes they don't understand. Right. And, and, it's, and it's really us we have to make our case and you know explain. How can you explain what culture shock is to a person who's never lived abroad? And you can say, of course, we all know when a student arrives here, we talk about culture shock and here, here, here. <coughs> respond to get, yeah, sure, that's not going to affect me. But of course, then we all know that it does happen. Um, I was just wondering if on home campus, management study abroad management is aware of this lack. Um, if there is an interest in becoming more internationalized and becoming more aware of what it means to run a, an international education program, is something that the forum perhaps, the forum, uh, forum on education abroad, is um, one of their objectives to involve home campus management more in uh, understanding the difficulties of the challenges? The forum is certainly doing a great job, and I think uh, you know conferences in the field um, are also very helpful. I also think that associations such as Akuki and even more. Um, you know, there's a lot that we're doing. I'm very optimistic. I think there's a lot that we're doing right now, but there's a lot that has to be done. So it will take time. I think. I think that I find it's kind of a weird for me to say. I find this fun. <laughs> a challenge. It's a challenge. It's a major challenge. It will take time. It will happen at some point. I see this happening at some point. So I will. You know. But as I said, I mean, these are little, these are baby steps to start um, looking at these things in a different way, to start talking about yourself in a different way, to start using a different language. The fact that my boss, Margaret, is not here, he is the Associate Professor International Fish, she was excited about this conference, she couldn't be here. But I think that's a, that's a very, um, it's a sign. Uh, the fact that this, this, in our case, they wanted staff member from our study program <coughs> select a person on campus. That's smart, I think. Okay, these are little steps. So let's let's look at the positives. Because talking about negatives doesn't help anyone. So I see a lot of positives. And it will take time. Okay, moving on. Now, almost, almost, almost at the end. What kind of, as I said, uh, remember when I was reading the position description about the resident director when they were asking a PhD and expertise around the finance and budget? What kind of for formal educational paths are available for us? Do you know, have you heard of any PhD in running a study or program? <laughs> Sorry? You have it? Oh! <laughs> Tell me about it! What about it? What? Oh, it's not in study abroad. Oh, okay. In you mean PhD in study abroad? No, no, no. It was a, a, it was a rhetorical question. Oh. I mean, how, what kind of pre formal preparation do we have? We are requested to have PhDs. I have a PhD in their history. I mean, literally, archives and all. Mm -hmm. Am I using my competence in theory of history? No. Am I using my PhD? Yes. Yes, it's very helpful. It's very helpful. Um, I think, again, as we need literature, as we need scholarly work on this field, as we need discussion, as we need to talk about this, we also need to start having formal, recognized, or certified professional paths. That's also necessary. Um, 
Now, let's talk about the last one, the last ones that I wanted to make. A lot of, um, a lot of uh, universities or providers, you know, that are in our field that are for-profit and non-profit <coughs> organizations, and a lot of, uh, a lot of universities and providers or for-profit organizations as part of international education businesses to make profit. Literally, to make profit. Some don't. Some universities start the business because it's good for the image of the program, because it's trendy, because uh, lately there's a lot of talking about a global citizen, yet no one knows what that is exactly. Um, you know, it's also a good way to recruit international students. So there are numerous reasons why uh, a, a an organization or a university can start a business abroad. Patrick, you were saying, you know, this costs a lot of money. But um, I found this number online, you know, that 70% of international ventures fail due to lack of intercultural awareness and fail due to lack of uh, adequate um, resources management. Now, this seems to, too high of a number, but regardless, this is not relevant. The number is not important. What is important is if the, the business has been thought of and planned, and if the business has started as a business, as a financial enterprise, how can we not consider the impact of inadequate human resources management on the business and the ability to, um, again, understand how intercultural competence is necessary in our field is capital development, okay? So, again, even if we wanted, let's just for, I think it's, it's, this is not the case, but let's for one moment pretend that the whole academic thing is not relevant. Even if you just wanted this to make money, it's, you know, I, I recently heard of a, um, a family here in Florence who owns a villa, and just because they own the villa, they want to start the study abroad program. <laughs> <laughs> Our field is made of that too. That's a reality check. So, again, let's if, even for those who are approaching this from a strictly financial and you know, managerial kind of a point of view, again, this is not a good idea in my opinion. The Major, for you, Barbara, you know this. The major cost of running an operation such as this is human. You know that too. Human resources. It's one of the highest costs in an operation like this. The reason was that. <laughs> so glad you're here. And I saw it from Rome. Um, I'll let you read the quote. Uh, but again, if we if we think about this in strictly managerial and financial terms, human resources. <laughs> are the big chunk, chunk, you know, the big uh, chunk of the pie. It's very important. So again, you want to think about how you invest and use your money. Anyone on Reddit? Okay. Sasha, what is that source? How is it? I'll give you, I'll give you the, um, it's in an article that I'm working on. I'll give you, I can give you all the details. They're the ones who also said that most HR models are yes. US based. Yeah, yes. Okay. yes. Uh, there's an interesting book, it's in my office, I can show it to you, on international education. Uh, uh, sorry, international management of, uh, okay, what on the uh, International Human Resources Management. Okay. It's very interesting. It's, um, it's a very good book, and um, it's also prepared so that you can if he's interested in courses. It's, it's very high level. I wouldn't use it for undergrads. Uh, but it gives a, a, a very good overview from the literature in the field since the late, the early 90s and It's been published in 2010, so it's quite recent. Um, <coughs> so we talked about the negative uh, outcomes of, you know, not investing sufficiently in human resources and not uh, considering uh, intercultural awareness sufficiently, but what are other potential negative outcomes? The image of the program, home institution, and even the home country, 
Mm. I had students come to me and complain, you know, oh, what, what can't you can't be racist for, for the you know, Americans? Yes, yes, make that happen. Um, image of the program, I'm sure most of you have read about the debates on the Chronicle recently about the treatment of faculty and how that, that reflects on the, on the home campus, the image of the university. You know, we, you start the business abroad because you want to uh, uh, represent your university in, in, a, in a shiny way, and yet this has can have negative consequences. Uh, the indirect cost, as I said, you know, if, if uh, the strategic planning, or if there's no strategic planning, or if uh, the care in human resources is inadequate, there are a lot of indirect costs, a lot. And this does affect preparation very heavily. Um, compatibility with ethical standards of universities. Universities have a mission statement about uh, social engagement, about um, cultural diversity, about um, uh, 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 you know, um, equal treatment, about professional development. But then, again, is this being done in the international uh, uh, activities and programs? So, um, to kind of conclude, this has been, I hope it's not being overwhelming. And again, I, I, I as, you know, as a personality, I don't like, I just don't like, I don't think that complaining is useful. I think it's not necessary. So I think a constructive discussion is necessary and it's, it's necessary to, uh, to just, you know, talk calmly about what the challenges and issues are. And for this reason, when I talk about this, I also like to think about what alternatives do we have? What is it possible? What can be done? You know, do we have options? Can we do anything? Yes, there are, there are little things that we can do. We can start in some ways. There are things that are possible. So um, strategic planning is always possible. It's always possible to think long term. It's, it's, it could be a good thing to consider sometimes in some programs regarding depending to define administrative and academic responsibilities, to establish um, clear protocols tailored to the host culture. When I was talking about communication before, you know, how there must be some thinking about how to do it, how to standardize it, and a clear communication and transparency. So there must be a better communication between the offshore uh, business or activity and the home campus, in my opinion. What kind of support and tools are available? I'll go through this very quickly. Cultural awareness training. Work for workshops on intercultural issues in both directions. Hear about the host, the home country institution and at the home country institution about the host culture. Both ways. This is necessary both ways. Consultants are always available, career development plans, uh, attention, if possible, if you have a large number of people, it's important to have someone that can dedicate time to human resources problem. Um, clarity of intentions and job description, that's also important. We can't just put everything together just because you need that. Um, clear assessment of strengths and qualifications. Aware of what is the clients are identity and network and professional organizations, such again, um, is very important to meet and discuss and then spread our So, I would like to conclude with this, uh, with this image, um, which I think it's representative of both what we do here in our field and what we try to do when we try to address this problem. There is a clear intention here to communicate. It's obvious, you know, these two people want to communicate. They are just used to do it in a different way. And I think this is emblematic of our field, you know. So we have to overcome these formal differences and try to uh, 
uh, find a way to communicate and find and establish a new language. I think we have to start from there, start to find new words that define our 